Welcome to Bicycle Retail Radio, the bicycle industry podcast that brings retailers, vendors, advocates, and thought leaders to the mic for honest discussions about the latest issues facing retailers while taking an in-depth look at the person within the profession. Welcome to the Flex. Today is one of my favorite episodes. This is our Technician Flex. It's our ongoing podcast feature where we focus specifically on the service center and mechanics. And it's produced in partnership with NBDA Educational Partner, Northwest Arkansas Community College Bicycle Assembly and Repair Technician Program Director, Benjamin Glenn. Benjamin. Hey, Heather. Great to see you again. Thanks for having me. I am stoked. So we're recording this. I think this episode is going to come out after the summit, but we are about one week uh, prior to the MBDA Retailer Summit happening in Bentonville, where where we're going to bring our guests um, to Bentonville and then also have an opportunity to tour the facility. I can't wait to see you. It's going to be awesome. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing you, seeing all the uh, the folks that are showing up for the summits. Uh, you know, like I was saying before the call, we've, we've done a little bit of uh, remodeling with our space. Uh, so if you did get a chance to, to poke your head in last year, you're at the summit last year, please, uh, you know, make time to come by, reach out to me. I'll, I'll be around on Friday as well. If you'd like to just swing in and see what's changed, uh, some fun stuff happening on campus here. Uh, so yeah, looking forward to seeing everyone at the summit next week. It's really cool. For our listeners who haven't heard of what's going on at the college there, uh, in just a year's time, um, interested mechanics can earn a Bicycle Industry Employers Association, that's B-E or B-I-E-A, accredited certification in bicycle assembly and repair. And they gain, and you can gain incredible skills in bicycle mechanics, wheel repair, assembly, suspension, service department operations, e-bikes. It's really amazing. Um, how many people have come through the program now, Ben, since since you've been there? So we've enrolled 68 students. Actually, it was running these numbers just yesterday. 68 students uh, with a 75% uh, completion rate. And that's really important because if you look at the... Uh, I, I get all techie and data with it, of course, right? Uh, so um, looked at the uh, Department of Labor the last 10 years uh, for other institutes, other two-year institutes that have some type of industry certification. So industry certification can be anything from, um, you know, car mechanics all the way to uh, electricians, whatever that is. Uh, the completion rate is about 71% over the past 10 years. And so we're setting at 75%. So I'm going to say that's a win right now for three years of work. So. And the bar high and bring more people, more qualified people into our industry. And I mean, we have people who are already working in shops that do go and take this program. I know you're doing workshops to give uh, community members an extra, um, you know, kind of glimpse into an in, in opportunity to be to learn how to work on their bikes more. There's lots of great things going. And you volunteer some of your time to come on our podcast and you answer the questions that our retailers, our listeners write with us. Um, which is really great. Thank you for doing that, Ben. You're awesome. You know, we have a lot of fun, don't we? It's a lot of fun. We do. So if you're listening and you have questions, it could be anything on service department operations, uh, continuing education, um, anything at all, really, when it comes to service and mechanics, just write to us. Uh, you can write to me, Heather at NBDA.com, and um, we'll answer your question live. And if you're listening, you can also view the podcast. You'll get to see Ben. You'll get to see the facility behind him and, um, yeah, take part even in a more, like, I guess, interactive way through our YouTube channel. Um, so Ben, how is the current class? Where are you guys? I think this is our episode seven, but but catch us up. It's May. So how's the class doing? Uh, we just graduated. So uh, everyone's uh, out doing their thing, right? Uh, we have um, about 12 students that are working locally in the industry. Uh, we graduated 21 through our program this year. So uh, the biggest cohort yet. We've got room for 24 in each cohort. Um, we've got students that are staying in school, finishing up their technical certificate or their associate's degree. Uh, we graduated two uh, high school students. So those students are actually working in shops now. Uh, one is at the new YT Mill in uh, downtown Bentonville, just next door to the ledger. So that'll be a really cool space when you're in, uh, in for ne next week's summit to check out. Uh, YT has just opened up kind of the, it's, it's like a writer support center, but they call it the mill. It's pretty cool. I got actually two students working there. Um, but yeah, so 
students uh, are out uh, enjoying a little bit of a break, uh, you know, working. Uh, I had one student that just started at a, a shop in downtown, uh, I guess, two weeks ago. And he's like, and I didn't realize it was going to be so much work. So <laughs> I think I think uh, he, he's excited. Um, he he definitely is putting in some time and looking forward to to learning more and just being in the retail space, which is a lot different than you know being here on campus and being able to focus on what you're doing. You know, retail space you get you know pulled so many different directions. So uh, a little bit different. But yeah, our students uh, just graduated last uh, this last Tuesday. Uh, next next cohorts, and I say cohorts because we'll have. Uh, a morning cohort and also classes in the afternoon, evening time. So we'll actually have two cohorts of students, uh, hopefully be able to capture some folks that have thought about the program, but just, you know, coming to school during the day is a little bit of a challenge, either work or other obligations. So, you know, this uh, this fall we'll be able to open up or we've opened up uh, courses in the evening. So hopefully those folks that have thought about it will, you know, that'll push them over uh, and and be allow them to come to bike college. So uh, things are going great. We're planning uh, some some fantastic uh, community events uh, through our community clinics that we'll have. Uh, we've got a four week community class as well. Uh, those are just strictly for bike owners, not anyone looking to really get into the to the uh, bicycle uh, repair career. I love that. I love what you're doing there. And our our industry is dynamic. I mean, I went to culinary school and I remember being in college and you're, you know, you're learning how to make soup or or cook a, I don't know, let's say steak. Mm -hmm. But then when you get out in the industry and you're actually on the line, it's dynamic. Things are coming from every angle and you're like, oh my God, I had no idea this was so challenging. So I'm imagining <laughs> when they actually get into the bicycle shop, they're like being, you know, pulled in so many different directions. So mm -hmm. uh, it must be pretty cool to see your students you know, out and about in the shops and that you had a role in that. That's I mean, it's amazing. amazing. Um, you know, I got to brag on one shop, Oz Bike Tech and Fit. Uh, that person went through our, our first cohort of students. Uh, he opened up his shop, expanded his uh, repair service, and he's hired five students uh, since then. So I say that's probably our biggest success story right there. Uh, it was a lot of fun working with his shop and, you know, going in and just, you know, seeing the students working and, and, you know, getting the, getting the jobs done, interacting with customers is, is fantastic. I love that. All right. Well, let's dive in. Cause I could, we could just keep talking. Um, I've got four questions. These are from retailers and these are, I, I went more technical side today. So we have questions on bicycle wheels, e-bikes, electronic shifting and brakes. Um, so we'll just go through each one. The first question, the retailer writes when servicing bicycle wheels, what are the important steps for truing and tensioning spokes to ensure proper alignment and durability? So especially for wheels subjected to high levels of stress in off-road or e-bike applications. So we're truing a wheel, we're tensioning those spokes. How do we ensure proper alignment and durability? Is there any pro tips there? Uh, you know, wheel work is is definitely not my favorite thing to do in the shop, but it, it can sometimes define, uh, you know, how well that shop performs uh, in its service center. You know, a, a rider uh, definitely might hold that shop to a little bit higher level uh, or higher standard if if they produce those good, uh, solid, round wheels. Um, so our our technicians, I need to, everyone needs to, that's working on wheels needs to have a high level of competency when it comes to wheel work. You know, wheels are, are kind of what make a bike, right? So, uh, you know, that bicycle wouldn't be a bicycle without those two wheels. Uh, so, so there is a little bit of a stress there. Um, I always, you know, say, start with the right spoke wrench, the right size, good working order, make sure your tools are in good condition. It, you know, good wheel work, uh, a good solid wheel, proper alignment, durability starts with just what we talked about, you know, that tension. Uh, typically keeping those spokes within about a 20% range or less of each other. And that uh, spoke tensiometer, you know, this is important, especially when you're building wheels to start out with uh, that tension, even across the spokes, across the rim, across the hub. Uh, that's really going to set you up with a good foundation to go in and do those lateral and radial um adjustments. You know, our students uh, are taught to have no more than a half millimeter lateral or radial tolerance. Uh, and then also, uh, you know, industry best practices is to keep the wheel dish less than one millimeter when you're comparing those two sizes. So a good solid wheel build, any good wheel work is going to start with 
seeing where that wheel is as far as using your tools, your your tensiometer, taking a good reading of that, even jumping onto Park Tools, um, their uh, tension app, uh, WTA, I think it, uh, WTA is what it's called. That'll help you map that out, get a good visual representation. You're able to track where those we, uh, the, spoke, the spoke tension is throughout that adjustment. It does take a little bit longer, but you will be very precise with that adjustment. Um, again, kind of going back to what I said, you know, having that high level of competency, having those skills is going to make sure that customers getting a well-built, properly aligned, very durable wheel. Uh, proper spoke tension is make, it will make all the difference in the life and the durability of that wheel sets. Spoke tension, you know, what, what are we talking about? How do we know what spoke tension to use, right? That that's There's a lot of things there. I was going to ask you, I'm like, how do you even know? I mean, I'm not a mechanic, yeah. but I play one sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely don't want to judge, uh, you know, just, just guess on this thing. Um, proper spoke tension is going to be, uh, or it, spoke tension is a combination of a lot of things. The spoke, the spoke size, the shape of the spoke even, and that material, of course. Lacing patterns, hub types, material of that hub, the size of the hub, the shape of the hub. Of course, then the, the whole rim, you had to take that in consideration, the size of the rim, the shape of the rim, the material that rim is made out of. So there's so many things to account for, and it's not something we can guess at. A good wheel a building app is fantastic. Uh, there's several different ones out there you can use. You always want to also check with that component manufacturer for best results. This will guarantee that wheel is going to be safe and functional for the rider. So, you know, go into the hub uh, manufacturers' websites, look for those tech documents, spokes as well, and rims as well. It's, the rims are really going to tell you a lot about what that spoke tension can be. Uh, I know uh, there's some carbon manufacturers out there that have specific tolerances around how much tension that rim can handle. So uh, make sure we're checking with those things. Do it right. Uh, make sure we're starting out with good even spoke tension, especially on on a you know a full wheel build. Uh, checking that spoke tension, recording it somehow. You know this is going to get you in the mindset of slowing down, taking your time, and delivering a quality product on the other side. I'm thinking of like that art of wheel building book or something. You know, it's oh, white yes. the wheel on the front. Yep, yep. Uh, I don't have that right here by me, but that is absolutely something that I've read before. So Jobs Brilliant Brant is is uh, the master of all wheel building books out there. So that that's uh, one one to consider as well. So uh, Calvin Jones, uh, he's got an amazing video on his YouTube uh, website with Park Tool uh, that really lays it out well. And I've used some of those resources before. Uh, and, and so, you know, if you're new to wheel work, uh, start out slow. Uh, and learn the correct steps. Come take classes. Uh, United Bicycle Institute has a fantastic wheel class. We have a 16-week wheel class as well. You know, there's there's opportunity to educate yourself and really deliver a, a quality product on the other side. Such an art form. It's such a skill. Uh, yeah. Mm. Thanks for that, Ben. All right, let's jump to our next one. I didn't know you had that 16-week class. That's pretty cool. Um, okay, this question comes from a retailer in Georgia. This is our electronic shifting question. The question is, in electronic shifting systems for bicycles, what are the common troubleshooting steps for diagnosing issues such as gear misalignment or unresponsive shifting? And how can riders perform basic maintenance to keep those systems functioning? This question has kind of caught me off guard because I thought it was like they do it automatically, but maybe I'm missing something. So I don't know. Ben, common uh, troubleshooting steps. I mean, technically, it almost is automatically, right? <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I just got into SRAM's transmission last September and absolutely have have loved it. So it's kind of my first off-road e-shifting system that I've had. I've had, had GRX, Shimano's GRX system on gravel bikes and DI2 as well. But uh, SRAM's transmission is... It's a different different ball game. Um, so electronic shifting is kind of almost, and I'm saying almost with air quotes around it, with an underlying italicized whatever. It's almost a plug and play system by now. There's a lot of innovation happening out there. If you if you check websites like bikerumor.com, they've got a big rundown and some recent uh, patents filed by Shimano. You know, so, so it's there's a lot of movement right now in that uh, electronic shifting space, electronic drivetrain space, um, but Proper installation is key. So that, that's really key, especially when it comes to SRAM's transmission. I remember um, talking with one of the field reps when transmission first launched, a lot of folks 
were calling that tech help support line because they wanted to install the product like a traditional drivetrain, which it does not install. It, you know, it does not install like a traditional drivetrain. There's no limit screws. You know, it's really comes down to the position of that derailleur. Kind of, if you think about like uh, the body alignment or the B, B gap on, on there. Uh, so it really comes down to that uh, piece and then kind of setting it up in a certain gear. Uh, but the one thing to, to, to make sure you get right is the um, uh, installation, keeping the system's batteries charged is the other step along with taking time to check for fir firmware and system updates as well. It's an electronic system. Uh, it doesn't, it doesn't just, you know, uh, you know, you push a switch and it light, you know, makes a light bulb, you know, flash on the other side of that little snap circuit. It, it's actually a, you know, a system that goes through kind of a, a CPU, kind of a brain that uh, allows that system to be up to date uh, as far as speed of the shifting, the custom customizable uh, functions of that derailleur as well through things like uh uh, the app that might be from SRAM, Shimano's eTube project app as well. Uh, that's where we're going to go to get those firmware and system updates. Actually, the SRAM transmission I have right now, uh, since September, I've had, I believe, three updates on it. So wow. that's that's quite a bit. But, you know, I'm checking that. I'm opening up the, the uh, SRAM app. It pops open, checks my stuff. Hey, there's an update available. I'll push that update there. You know, did it make a difference on the ride? I don't, I don't know, but you know, I'm, I'm following those steps so that I can make sure that I, if anything new comes through, I, I want that latest, greatest update, to make sure my system's working properly. Uh, so cloud-based apps, um, Shram's app, Shimano's E-Tube apps, that's where we're going to find all of those updates, make sure we're, we're, we're keeping that updated. Another thing here with any, anytime we're talking about electronic uh, systems, whether that's through the shifting or e-bike. Uh, in your retail space on that POS system you have, make sure you're noting those as well on the, on the writer's ticket. Hey, we updated your, your yeah. drivetrain today. So you have the latest, greatest information from SRAM or Shimano, who, whoever that is. Hey, we updated your, your uh, e-bike system. You know, it's been updated as of this date. So keeping track of that, it's going to go a long way and just you know, making sure that rider uh, bring, you know, you're going to bring some value to that rider's experience in your service center that you're, you know, you're doing your due diligence to keep that uh, um, service uh, accounted for what you're doing. Um, so we've talked a lot about electronics. There's the other side of that, which is actually the me mechanical side, right? Um, so we still have a chain. We still have cogs. We have still have things like that. Mm -hmm. And that's where those basic maintenance uh, pieces come in. You know, clean cogs, clean chain, using the appropriate lubrication. That's really the part of that basic maintenance that we still have to do, even though we have this, you know, premium uh, shifter and derailleur. Uh, this is only going to extend the life of that premium drivetrain. And that rider's made a really big investment in that drivetrain, especially if, you know, if they've went through, you know, the the, the latest innovations. So uh, making sure that we're cleaning things as they should be cleaned uh, and then using the appropriate lubrication. So that's the basic maintenance piece there. That's gonna keep the system functioning smoothly, gonna get nice crisp shifts out of that system. Once it's installed properly, it's got the right updates, your batteries are charged. That those those things, it really comes down to that end piece there is where you know, you're gonna do the maintenance just like you would any other drivetrain. Um, what am I missing here? Oh, um, one last thing on, on SRAM's drivetrain. So those SRAM access systems, uh, remove the batteries, so remove that access battery, and then there's a little red cover, the terminal cover. Make sure you install that terminal cover before you introduce any water, any cleaning. It's going to keep those terminals nice and clean, and then you can just put that battery back in after everything kind of dries, and you, you've got the system ready to go for the rider. So that's that's one piece of advice there. When we're, if we can remove the battery, let's remove that battery and keep those terminal cover or covers in place while we're cleaning them. Yeah. So a little rider education, you know, not forgetting that there's that mechanical side too. Mm. So great, great tip. Yep, there. Exactly. Yep. Um, all right, let's keep rolling. Uh, the next one, uh, e-bikes, e-bikes. There's always a question on e-bikes. And this one actually, I, I, ha I have a lot of retailers who bring this up. Uh, how do brake systems on e-bikes differ from traditional 
bicycle brakes mm -hmm. in terms of design, maintenance requirements, and performance considerations. I think mm -hmm. of the weight of e-bikes, but I don't know. I'm going to let you, <laughs> it's your question, so you get it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're absolutely on the right track. You know, we have a, a, a more weight. We have more things on that bike. It's heavier, can go faster as well. Uh, you know, brakes, I, I love braking systems. I'm a big fan of, I'm going to plug Magira real quick. I love Magira's brakes. I've been a fan of theirs since, I don't know, like early 2000s, something like that. So they're awesome brakes. But anyway, that's that's another conversation, right? So uh, e-bikes, you know, we, we've seen this huge rise in e-bike compatibility components across the entire bike. You know, since e-bikes have, have been around, you know, we're always trying to, um, you know, bring the latest and greatest out there. We've seen uh, e-bike compatible chains, cogs, wheels, tires, you know, and then of course the the brakes that are labeled as e-bike compatible. Uh, you know, we have some of those in the in the lab uh, that we work on. We talk about the differences there. So e-bikes, uh, the brakes really come down to powerful and reliable brakes. Those are essential. Having the appropriate braking system is vital to safety. So so braking systems on any bike. That's your safety feature, right? So we need to establish that first of all. These these systems have to work as perfectly as possible. They have to function like they're designed to function. So you know, make sure that we're always paying attention to the braking system. So measuring your your brake pad wear, your rotor wear, rim brake, or your if you got a rim brake, you're measuring that rim, making sure that the the rim is uh, you know not beyond wear. So that's that's just any bike, but e bikes. That's especially true because you know, like Heather said, you know, we've got a heavier bike, we're going faster, hopefully riding it more, right? Uh, you know, e-bikes are a blast to ride. So hopefully you're getting out and riding it a little bit more. Uh, when it comes to disc brakes, though, on an e-bike, we always want to make sure that we're bedding in those new rotors and pads. And that's really on any any uh, disc brake bike. Bedding in, you know, what is, what is bedding in? Uh, when bedding in, when done correctly, applies just a thin layer of, of that brake pad material evenly across the rotor, which results in a level braking surface for, so whenever the pads contact that, they're, they're contacting a level uh, braking surface. And this typically, that, that level uh, braking surface typically will last the life of the brake pad. Um, oftentimes we're seeing e-bikes that are equipped with larger rotors, more robust calipers, like a four piston caliper instead of a two piston caliper. And we're really seeing those four piston calipers on those premium, premium uh, price point by e-bikes. Uh, so, so, you know, your, your uh, $1,000 e-bike might not have that four piston caliper on there. Uh, you might even see like electronic kill switches incorporated into the brake lever that tells the e-system to cut power to the motor during braking. Magura and Bosch have been doing this for years. So they, they're one brand that I'm thinking of that have kind of teamed up and they, you know, they do something like that, even incorporating some type of, of a brake light. So when you pull the lever, you know, a, a brake light comes on in the back and says, hey, I'm, I'm braking just like in a, in a vehicle, uh, you know, a car or on a motorcycle. So uh, let's talk about service real quick. Uh, so proper service, brake bleeds, caliper replacement, caliper I'm sorry, uh, rotor replacement, brake pad replacement, caliper cleaning. Those are all crucial to uh, properly functioning, functioning braking system on any bike. E-bikes, heavier, typically ridden at higher rates of speed, hopefully ridden more often. With those, to con those pieces to consider, maintenance will absolutely be more, frequent, be more frequent in these systems. You're probably going to be replacing brake pads more. You're probably going to be replacing rotors more because you're you have a heavier bike, your higher rates of speed, maybe you're riding it more often. So these items are going to wear more quickly. These are wear items. So take time to educate your customer on the importance of brake maintenance on their e-bikes. These are safety features. It all comes down to that piece right there, making sure that you have a functioning brake uh, that's uh, doing its job, slowing you down and going to keep you safe. There's so much here to think about, and it's such an important topic, uh, you know, minimizing that risk and making sure yeah. that we are making sure that these e-bikes um, are being looked after. Uh, thank you for that. Let's see. One final question today. Let's keep rolling. Yeah. Uh, wow. This one's kind of similar. I don't know what I was mm -hmm. thinking here, but well, I guess like if we haven't already covered this, uh, re when replacing brake pads on e-bikes, 
um, which we just determined is really important. What factors should riders consider in selecting the appropriate pad compound? So this is like, I guess, a little bit more detailed. Um, so appropriate pad compound for riding style and conditions. And then as you were talking about that bedding in, mm. uh, is there any techniques that we want to use to ensure proper bedding in? So mm. yeah. Thing. A little more detail here, Ben. Yeah, we're going a little bit more granular. Uh, yeah. This is great. You know, uh, I, I was doing some uh, some looking around for e bikes class. I guess it was back in December, and saw some e bikes with rim brakes on them. So I, I just want to like throw it out there. Let's all agree that e rim brakes have no place on an e bike, right? Disc brakes are the only way to go to ensure a safe uh, functioning uh, braking system. So let's let's keep the the disc uh, the e bike brakes to disc brakes. Uh, especially for this question, so we can answer it appropriately, uh, you know, given that we're, we're going a little bit deeper on that bedding in process. Um, let's see. We're going to make sure our rotors and pads are compatible with each other. Um, some rotors will say, you know, that they're only compatible with that uh, organic pad uh, or metallic pad. So you have kind of two different compounds with the, with the, with the brake pad itself. And then that rotor is going to be optimized within that manufacturing process to handle whatever pad material. Some brake pad or some brake rotors, you can go either way. Just check those labels, see what it says, what's stamped on the rotor or on that packaging to see what uh, brake pad you can actually use with that. So that might determine, you know, how you even sell that product, how you even might, you know, uh, approach that customer with when you're replacing those brake pads, when you're replacing the rotors. So establish those things, you know, our disc brakes can be either mechanical or hydraulic. Hydraulic is definitely the best choice. A lot of e-bikes might not come stock with hydraulic those discs. Uh, we might have, uh, you know, a price point that really sells well, but they have mechanical disc brakes on there. Please educate your rider that, you know, for that mechanical system to function properly, the cable and housing that operates that system have to be in good working condition. So sometimes we'll have to include that in the service. So we might have to replace the cable and housing along with those pads and rotors. So there might be a little bit different uh, approach to our service with a mechanical brake versus a hydraulic brake. When we're talking about brake pad material, organic brake pads, if you will, those are going to give the rider a quieter, smoother brake feel uh, than a metallic pad is going to be. So a Organic pad is just basically compressed material. It's applied to the, uh, the the backing of the brake pad just through pressure and heat. So it's kind of forced uh, bonded, but you know, onto the braking pad uh, backing. A mechanic or a metallic pad adds more material into that, and again, it's pressed onto the uh, backing plates. Our organic pad is going to have actually some resin in there or some type of bonding agent uh, when the metallic pad is, is not going to have as much or even have some of that at all. So, you know, you're going to have different bits of material uh, throughout that braking pad. Um, it, it's going to be kind of a mixture between all sorts of different uh, material there. So um, just know that they're, they're labeled organic, metallic. There's going to be some different labels out there from di for different ma manufacturers and or pairing those appropriately with our rotor. Uh, organic pad material is going to wear away a little bit quicker, while metallic pads typically last a little bit longer, but can get a little noisy with wear. And, but the good, good thing about me metallic is that they'll perform a little bit better in wet and muddy conditions. So that that is a, a nice piece there. Yeah. Um Love, I was going to say, I love that you just went into that because I feel like so many of us, we, you know, in our stores, we might stock organic and metallic, but maybe our staff doesn't actually know or isn't communicating properly to the customer, like the difference between the two or the customers don't even know. So they're just like, ah, I'll just buy this one. So I love that you mm -hmm. just went into that. <laughs> yeah, you can get deep. You know, we have that whole 16 week class on breaking systems. And this is one of those pieces there. We even talk about, uh, you know, you ever seen those rotors that have kind of like you know, they might have like a black spider that holds the the rotor actual braking surface on, yeah. um, or they might just be kind of painted black. That's actually uh, heat dissipating paint, so it actually helps to dissipate the heat uh, from that rotor. So it 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 does serve a purpose other than just looking cool. Uh, it's you know kind of kind of fancy there, but uh, it, you know it does it does serve a purpose there. 
Um, let's talk about proper bedding in. Um, when you're bedding in a rotor or bedding in a rotor with the brake pad, uh, you always want to make sure that you're only bedding in one brake at a time. We're, so we're going to do the fronts and then we're going to do the rear brake. Typically how this is done is you'll go out and ride the bike if you can. Uh, there's some some uh, some machines out there that kind of will help you do this in the shop. So I know not every shop is going to have the ability or maybe it's not safe or maybe you just a location you can't actually get outside and, and ride a bike. I know I've, I've I, I've got friends that have worked in uh, retail spaces where, hey, there's not really room either at the back of the, you know, wherever we are, back of the building, or even in the parking lot. So, you know, it just might not be ideal for getting out and doing this. So, you know, uh, there might be some workarounds. Happy to, to discuss those. Uh, there, there's some machines out there you can buy. But anyway, so let's go back to the bedding in process. So I'm, I'm going to I'm gonna bed in my, um, my front brake. So I'm going to get on the bike, I'm going to ride it, get it up to kind of like jogging pace, if you will. And then I'm going to slowly brake. I'm not going to stop all the way, but I'm going to get it down to kind of a, a walking pace. I'm going to speed up again to that jogging pace, start slowing that uh, front brake down to a walking pace. And I'm going to do this. It depends on the manufacturer. Some manufacturers say 10 times, some say 30 times. So it really can depend. Um and then I'm going to do the same thing with the rear. So front brake, rear brake, and then I should be good. Whenever you look at that rotor, actually, I wish I would have picked one up. I've got a really well burned, uh, bedded in uh, rotor that I use in class for an example. But you're going to see just a little bit of that braking material. It kind of looks like the uh, the rotor's worn. Uh, so so kind of some, some of the material, you'll be able to see it. It's kind of darker than the rest of the rotor. That brake track will be nice and worn in a little bit. And that's going to Again, it distributes the braking uh, pad material across that brake pad. Nice, even surface. It's going to allow that brake to perform uh, like it's designed to. You're going to get a better result. You're going to almost reduce or take care of any of those, you know, uh, sometimes when you get a new new brake or new bike, you might feel like it's the brake is just chattering a little bit. That's going to take care of that. So all of those uneven spaces are, go are gone. So we got a nice flat level braking surface. And now we can go out, use the bike, the brakes, like they should, like they're designed to be used. So. I love that you just went into detail on that because as a mountain biker, when my brakes are not working good, it's so super frustrating. Um, I'm also a person who rides my pads past the point and then I hear that it's bad. It gets really bad. <laughs> Is there any like anything that we should tell consumers like when they, how they would notice that it's time to mm. place their pads. Uh, I mean, I don't know, just general rule of thumb. Yeah, absolutely. This is where um, your POS system is going to come in uh, handy, where you can uh, hopefully be able to send out a text message. Hey, it's time for your yearly maintenance check, something like that. Hey, we're going to do just a wear item check for you. Uh, something of that nature. So offering that as a service, hey, we're just going to check check your chain wear we're going to look at your cogs, things of that nature, and we're also going to check your brake pads. So this is just a wear check, right? So so there's a lot of a lot of ways around this. But another thing there is just at that time the customers in the shop, you know, of course, you know, you're not going to remember everything, right? But uh, just remind them brake pads, chains, those are all wear items. So let's take a look at that. Um, if you've done a great job up front selling that bike, that's going to be part of your selling points as well, or it can be. Um, how do you know as a rider when the brakes are not performing. So that brake lever is going to feel a little, little bit different. Uh, you know, it's going to start fading. You possibly might feel uh, feel like the brakes, you can't, you know, maybe lock up the rear wheel uh, at times or, you know, there's going to be some some level of performance degradation there. So, you know, the, it's not going to be optimal. I just did a brake, uh, brake bleed on my front brake. I felt like it was just wasn't performing right. Come to find out it was time for brake pads. Uh, actually went ahead and put a new rotor on there. It's that's that's how I am. And I went ahead and did a front brake bleed as well. It's working really great. The rear, it's probably about time. It's been about a month since I did that last one. Seems like the, the front was a little bit uh, more worn than the rear. So I noticed a, a decline in performance. Uh, you know, didn't feel like the brake was was doing its job. And so, you know, that that was that was my sign as as a rider. Hey, I need to get I need to get this uh, taken care of or take a look at these brake pads and see what that wear is. And that's another piece, like, how do you know when to change those brake pads? Like, what's the wear point? 
some manufacturers will actually have some type of wear indicator on that brake pad. And then oftentimes what they're going to actually say is take a measurement with some, with, uh, you know, some calipers and see where that pad is actually taking that millimeter measurement. And here's, here's the range we like our brake pads uh, to fall within. So there's, there's a minimum wear to those brake pads. Obviously, if you see that brake pad material is completely gone and all you see is that backing plate, replace those brake pads, probably time to do a little bit more maintenance to that bike as well. Uh, you know, that, that brake is probably needing a lot of love. So I'm yeah. definitely in that, in that caliber. I go way past. Um, so just a general, a general thought is, yeah, remind, you know, let your riders know, especially if you're in a hilly area, if they're hitting yeah. the downhill park, you know, this is something they should be looking at often. Um, yeah. Yeah, wet right? weather riding as well. You know, if you're riding in wet weather a lot, um, you know, expect to have more wear and tear on the on the drivetrain and the brake pads themselves. So, so much here, Ben. Thank you. I mean, I don't even know where the time goes when we when we just start talking. You're just such yeah. a resource of knowledge over there. Can't wait to come see you. Uh, can't wait to see the new facility and the trail building school. Um, if you're listening, look at our YouTube channel. Um, you can see a version of the episode with images, our fun faces. If you want us to answer your questions, any questions at all, um, anything rolls really, it's heather at nbda.com. Uh, thanks for listening. Ben, great to see you again. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, great to be here. Look forward to seeing you next week. All right. Bye, Ben. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to Bicycle Retail Radio. This podcast is designed specifically for the bicycle industry, dedicated to strengthening our retailers and cycling community. If it is your first episode, we urge you to take the time and listen to our past episodes. 